Welcome to the Black Creator Series, brought to you by Candlewick Press in collaboration with Red Clay Educators, hosted by Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul, bringing dynamic books, authors, illustrators, and artists to your classroom and to the world. Look for episodes of the Black Creator Series on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Our guest creator this episode is Fawebe Sinclair. Confessions of a Candy Snatcher, her debut novel, featuring zines crafted by award-winning illustrator Theodore Taylor III, relates an emotive, reflective story about the wonder and mess of growing up. Here's your host, New York Times best-selling author, Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul, founder of Red Clay Educators and co-founder of the Institute for Racial Equity in Literacy. Fawebe, welcome to the Black Creator Series. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm very excited. I've listened to a bunch of these, so it's really an honor to participate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, on your website, you describe yourself as many things, (laughs) and one in particular is a zenister. And we know that zines are a big part of your novel, which we will talk about in, uh, in a few moments, but... What exactly is a zine and how did your love and talent as a zinister begin? <laughs> I love that's the first question. Um, I just recently started identifying as a person who makes zines. Um, a zine is a do-it-yourself publication. Um, they come out of a lot of different cultural spaces. I often attribute them to the, like the punk scene or the um, fandom scenes, um, feminism, LGBTQ plus folks. There are all these different scenes that have um, made use of this form because as I said, it's do it yourself. You write, you draw, you write poetry, you whatever it is that you create and you put it in a small booklet form. And then you can either just have one or you can make many copies and give them out Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, make it so that the people who you want to communicate with have access to it often for free. Sometimes there's a little um, money involved, but mostly they're just out there in the world. I see them all the time, actually popping up here in Boston in coffee shops, giving away for free. Um, There's events Uh, this past weekend. I went to a, a zine Fest uh, at the Watertown Public Library, um, but I've been going to Zine Fests and Zine events uh, almost as long as I've been here in Boston in one form or another. Wow. And in what ways do you imagine Confessions of a Candy Snatcher, which we are going to talk about, being an, an invitation for middle grade readers in particular to, to write? And how might educators use zines as an invitation for authentic self-expression, as well as invitations to heal. One way in is through inviting kids to understand and develop their sense of voice. One of the things that I really, really love about zines in particular is that it is you. (laughs) You know, it is how you think, it is how you talk, it is how you draw, however you engage with them. And so I think it's rare for kids to really get the opportunity to be voiced by their own words mm-hmm. and their own experiences. And they can be silly, they can be serious. It's, it runs the gamut. So I think in particular with zines, you have that opportunity right off the bat. And it's it's an easy entry. You know, poetry can be hard for people. You have to learn, you gotta figure out all those different spaces and syntax and pentameter, but zines, you fold them, you sit down with your pen or your pencil or your crayon, and you just go. And that is you on that page. And it is something tactile. Right. So I think in terms of like learning about moving yourself through things, particularly hard things, one great way to do that is to engage via zines, because then also you can share them, right? They're intended to be given generally to your friends, to other people who are important in your life. Um, And so I think in terms of healing, that's one really, really amazing opportunity. I think one of the benefits of zines are their brevity. They are very accessible. If you can't write, 
because you are five <laughs> and you're just learning your letters or you are more oriented towards um, the world of drawing or some other kind of expressive form, they're very, very accessible. You can make, um, there's like a one page version that I've been teaching people about, the mini zine or the tiny zine, where you take one piece of paper and you fold it and then you have eight pages. Right. You know, and, and, and if you really want to be conservative, you, one of those pages is a cover and the other is the end cover. So then you only have, you know, a smaller number of pages to fill. Um, and so I think for educators in particular, this is a such a great tool because you can use them for literally anything. And they're a way for people to process what they've experienced. So I at the Zine Festival I was at this weekend, um, there were there were two educators next to me actually, like a librarian uh, at a table next to me, a librarian and um, a teacher. And they had all of these student-made zines on their table. And so people were coming up and chatting with them, including the students who made the zines. Um, and there was this really lovely exchange between the educators, the kids who made the zines, the people who were just visiting the festival, all about what the kids were thinking about and how they were invited to create these little pieces of art, you know, and that they can complete, which is, I really want to put emphasis on that. Like you can finish it, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is a major struggle in the world of art making, you know, starting is hard and finishing is hard. So I think also if one was using this in their classroom, I mean, it's, it, it's discreet. Um, it's very easy to understand. There's that real excitement of being able to like fold the paper and have the, the empty booklet in front of you. Like there's so many different ways to find satisfaction in making them that I think it, this, if I had been, had access to this as a kid, I would have been so psyched because I was already making small books, but I didn't know about zines and I didn't know there was, there was a culture, you know, or, or cultures around it, like a world that I could have been engaging in. Maybe it wasn't totally developed at that point. I don't know, at least for younger people, but it's it's very exciting to know it's out there now. Yeah. Um, and I did end up swapping a zine with one of the kids who was the artist from the zine on the next table. So that was really fun. Yeah, I think the uh, value and power of this in educational spaces is, is just, you know, un, un, untapped, I think. Mm-hmm. In many, mm-hmm. many classrooms in schools, we have so many young writers for whom educators are stressing for them to write more, to elaborate. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like they're writing in their ideas and their their creativity doesn't count unless mm-hmm. it's five pages. And yet all around us, we see brilliance and brevity. We see mm-hmm. brilliance and conciseness. We see that culture rippling everywhere, social media, um, art. And and what if instead of saying to kids, you need to write more, we said, look at this, you know, I want to introduce a zine to you because I see you as a writer who might be interested in this as an art form. I see your potential here. So uh, I hope that um, Confessions of a Candy Snatcher will encourage educators in that way. This is a coming of age story that is urgently needed for middle school readers. Readers get to see Jonas, a 12 year old black boy in all of the complexities that exist within a young person going through puberty and trying to make sense of his relationships Mm -hmm. with friends, parents, teachers, his joys, his insecurities, and his mess ups. Mm -hmm. Often there's little room for young people to work out all that they are, you know, going through. Um, How might we as educators, as caregivers, offer young people a bit more grace Mm. and and less grief so that they can grow? I love that um, grace that you're using that word because that is part of what is happening in this book. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, I think it's a, it's a tool and it's also a skill and it's also a, 
a thing that one has to practice. Now, I, I think, you know, to your point about <laughs> less grief, <laughs> um, it's very easy in how we orient as animals to look at what is difficult and to stay in that space. Um, it, I think it's, you know, part of how we are able to survive and that's important, but I am personally oriented towards having more opportunities to learn from what we see and to interpret it and reinterpret it and reinterpret it again, which is what Jonas is doing in the zines is learning how to tell the story and to tell it through different facets. And through that, he's sort of creating something new. So I think, you know, for young people, particularly who are new to the world, <laughs> You know, I think so much grace is often offered because they're younger, which I, I appreciate that. But I think even more can be given to what people often interpret as problematic behavior mm -hmm. or um, some kind of fault in the personhood of the child um, or, you know, uh, just stubbornness. Like, I think a lot of these ideas are put on young people in particular when in fact they haven't even, they don't have the years on the planet to get to the point where they can step back from what they're doing and interpret it and think about what that means and think about their choices. Like they can choose to do it differently. Yeah. And that was part of what was really interesting to me about writing this book was once I found my way into Jonas's voice, because if you notice as a reader reading the book, he actually doesn't talk a lot. He thinks more than he talks. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a lot of thoughts about people <laughs> and a lot of, of judgment and opinions, but he doesn't say most of that. Right. So the way for me to get into his voice was through the zines. Mm -hmm. And then the zines were a way for him to, as I said, reinterpret and re-experience some of what had happened on that night and to, to make a new decision about it. Yeah. And I think this book offers educators and um, administrators so much to think about as we know the realities for young Black boys in schools, the data around disciplinary actions and how this contributes to the school to prison pipeline. I feel like this novel is an invitation for educators to consider how they can support young boys in particular and see them completely to see their sensitivities and fears and talents and, and to see their humanity. I have to ask you a question about punctuation. I'm not sure that I've read a novel for middle grade readers that uh, wasn't a graphic novel that didn't include quotation marks. So what went into the decision to avoid them in this novel? Oh, yes. I have a whole zine about this <laughs> that I ended up writing for my editor to explain how this happened. Um, first, the novel. So the novel is um, 18 years old. I started it in 2005. It started as a conventional book with quotation marks. Um, and it started with voice. It actually, the first line of the book um, isn't the first thing I heard in my head when I was you know, composing the, the initial chapters. It was actually one of his friends, Mikey saying his name over and over again. That was like the first thing I heard and that's how the book began. Um, mm -hmm. And that was all very conventional. Um, but somewhere in those first five years, the quotation, the quotation marks just went away. And I didn't, you know, it took me a while to figure out why I just went with it because that's the kind of writer I am. You know, as the book develops, I follow what it wants to do. I don't make force it or make choices for it because it needs to go where it needs to go. Um, and so what ended up happening was I was looking for rhythm and how the kids talk and how the adults talk to them and with just what how Jonas is experiencing the world, you know, the, the comment he makes in the beginning about the, the trees being cold because they don't have leaves on them, things like that are, I wanted that to rise up and be really present in the book. And one way to do that and to increase intimacy was to take out those extra pieces uh, and to put as much white space in the book as possible. Like I wanted 
the experience of the book for anyone, young people, or older people to feel like it's like you can breathe in it, you yeah. know, that, that you can be in this book with this character without any of the normal conventions getting in the way of your experience and, and to have that sense of intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, and it is really unconventional, um, at least in young people's books to, to do that, because I know that there's a risk there that readers who struggle, who, who really make use of those um, punctuations, like quotation marks, this is gonna be maybe a bit of a, a tough read for them. Um, but I had also hoped, even though I, I'm a, I acknowledge that, that the rhythm of the book and the way that people talk could carry them along without it. Yeah, I feel like freeing the writing from the quotation marks really does heighten the intimacy, as you said, and also the intensity that you create as readers just get folded into the world of, of these compelling characters. I want to talk with you about toxic masculinity, hmm. uh, this sociocultural idea of manliness as aggressive, homophobic, and dominating. How do we help boys resist this pressure uh, to act in ways that are harmful and imagine a different way of being in the world? I mean, I think one of the ways in, at least for me, has been to embrace the idea of masculinities, um, the plural. And in the book, I really spent some time with that because I know that there are these pressures that I, as a female body person, don't experience um, that male body people do around like what you can and cannot say and be. And in the book, I intentionally put in Stu, which is his older friend, um, who is a queer Asian man um, who had a different version of what it was to be male. And then he has a boyfriend who is this like buff, you know, um, skateboarder type. And the way that they interact with one another, Jonas has been witness to for a long time. These are Jonas's people. Yeah. Um, and I really love their relationship. Um, like Stu does not let him get away with things, mm -hmm. but he also is so there for him. Yeah. And I think like the being able to witness that and not be told it, it's just there in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the way that his dad interacts and his dad's, you know, employment and like how he he's a man of words. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are other people in the book, um, like Robin, who is female, but has some, you know, she's got some difference to her. Um, and so I think just having these um, these other examples. Mm -hmm permits Jonas to to move and try on different versions of himself. Yeah. And you see that too with his interaction with his sister, like the way that he caretakes her and is so annoyed by her, um, but also so um, cautious around, you know, her her safety uh, and how she, you know, <laughs> I don't know, just the way that they interact is just so funny and fresh. And I think all of these pieces come together to create a different kind of story a, a story among other stories, I should say, not just that it's different, um, that you can sort of partake in and understand how how you can be with people. And I appreciate how you invite readers to think deeply about many issues, such as bullying, um, what it is and uh, who that label is attributed to. So Mikey, right, is uh, who young people might easily point to as a bully. Um, his actions are extreme, his behavior, and, and there's an indication that his mother has run into some trouble, all contribute to this character being easily pegged as a bully. Mm -hmm. But Jonas, who is a good student, he's typically polite, um, has solid relationships with his, uh, with a diverse group of friends, mm -hmm. wrestles with his own actions and whether he's also a bully. What are you hoping readers will think about bullying as they engage confessions of a candy snatcher? Mm, I think what I really hope people take away is that people are complex. Um, situations change and you can't predict things necessarily. Mm. Um, and how you respond, however, is important. So 
it's interesting because when I first started working on this book many years ago now, bullying was where I started. I was curious about that, you know, as a child of the 80s and 90s, it was treated very differently then than it is now. Um, and I wanted to explore it. But then as I started to explore it, I started to unravel all these pieces. Um, and Mikey was one of like one way into thinking about like, wh what is it he's doing? Like, how is he, um, like, how are his actions interpreted by other characters? Like, what in there, in him in particular, is driving him towards this? Um, and Jonas, I think, isn't very, initially, he's not particularly kind to Mikey. Um, they have this rivalry going on. Um, and I think, I hope over time, Jonas starts to have a better understanding of him, even while he doesn't agree with his actions. And so I think, I hope that young people recognize that there's bullying in this book. Um, and it's not the typical um, one person going after, you know, one other person consistently, you know, with the whole so sort of story set that you expect. But the, the, these are incidents, of, you know, that Jonas is witness to, experiences, and also sometimes partakes in of someone who himself would be considered a bully. <laughs> you know, so there is this exchange that's happening. Things are not simple, and it's an invitation to the gray space of that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's tough. Yeah. And this novel, it touches upon racism and particularly spotlights homophobia. So readers see Mikey say and act in ways that are homophobic and offensive. What's interesting is how his friends react to this. It's clear that Jonas is bothered uh, by Mikey's homophobia. Other friends laugh or are silent. Mm. So I think you just paint a picture of, of, of what this actually looks like in, in the real world when, when we are in the face of this. Jonas seems to be more conscious, mm -hmm. uh, but he doesn't name this directly. Mm -hmm. What ideas about being a bystander or an upstander mm -hmm. do, you know, do you, are you challenging readers to think about? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think I, you name it perfectly. It's these things that are happening and you need to respond in the moment. Yeah. But you don't have all the information. You don't even have all the information in your own head about how you feel about it. Right. So I think for me, it was important to have Stu woven through Jonas's life and also for Stu to have a partner, which because one thing that happens a lot in literature is that at least a certain amount of literature from the, the before times is that people wouldn't have partners. They'd just be considered, you know, this person is gay, this person is a lesbian. So for me to have... Stu have his partner and have Jonas um, have interactions with both of them that were warm um, and generative. Where it, that was a, a direct contrast to how Mikey is interacting with Stu. And the readers can see that contrast without it being spelled out because that's how it is in life. Often it is not spelled out for you. And you will not necessarily use the words, this is homophobic, this is racist, but you know something is weird. You know something is going on mm -hmm. and you might miss your, your opportunity to react in that moment, but then you'll have another opportunity. And so that was part of what's happening for Jonas in the book is that he's learning how to stand up for his people, mm -hmm. um, but also that he's learning that you can't always do it right when you want to. You kind of have to like find your opportunity. Yeah, I appreciate the way you allow readers to sit squarely in the discomfort of of, of this. Um, that's what I experienced, you know, when I was reading this, like, okay, I'm, I'm in discomfort. And um, I think it's so important for, for readers to experience that, which helps them process, I think, mm. um, and consider how they will show up um, mm. in the moment when, when they need to. Um, we have to talk about the character C, Concepcion, and mm -hmm. yeah, we learn that each of these characters have experienced something traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, Jonas and middle grade readers are invited to really think about the issue of consent mm 
-hmm. in various ways at a time when boys in particular are experiencing so much physical growth and chemical Mm -hmm. changes in their bodies, right? These two young girls are also growing and changing and have had to fight for their safety at the hands of men and boys. Mm -hmm. How How do they influence Jonas and how might they influence readers? See it. Um, has always been a, a curiosity to me. Like, I, I still don't totally know who she is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it took me about a decade to figure out where she was from, who her people were. But yeah. she is, she's fierce, but mm-hmm. she's also vulnerable. Yeah. And I think she is one of Jonas's greatest teachers in terms of inviting him to partake in the zine, actually forcing him to do it. Um, and to also need him at a, a crucial moment in the book that in a way that he doesn't expect. So I think like for C, she is she contains all of these, these elements um, that Jonas hasn't really had access to before witness before I mean she bursts into the scene in his life and is like I am here (laughs) and you are my friend and there is no questions about this um and I I love that sense of life in her but also there is an experience that she has that has a return that he's witness to which is very frightening for him um and conversely or maybe also connected to that um there are pieces of Gideon that he doesn't expect because he has Gideon pegged in the book. He thinks he knows who she is based on what she looks like, based on her size, based on his experience with her. But clearly he does not know. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's fun. It was fun for me to write. And I hope it's fun for readers to experience that um, his assumptions about Gideon are not true. Um, and it's a great learning for him to realize that the people are um, so much more than what they appear to be. We have to give a shout out to the illustrator, Theodore Taylor III, um, because what a delight to you know read across this novel and encounter the art um, that is included. So what's next for you, Foe Bay? Mm. What can readers look forward to? Oh, I have other manuscripts. Um, I haven't, I can't talk too much about them yet because they're not um, in the pipeline just yet, but I I write across all spaces. Um, so I have some picture book ideas that I'm really excited about. Um, and then I also grew up and still do read a lot of comics, um, which is part of why that zine is so you know present in the book. Um, and I have a a manuscript for graphic novel that I'm really excited about. So I definitely have other works and they're going to be for different ages because that's just how they come out when I sit down to write them. So it's one of the pleasures of my particular experience of writing is that. Well, Fawebe Confessions of a Candy Snatcher is about so much more than its title. Mm. Um, In it, you allow Jonas to uh, write Uh, a haiku about freedom that he thinks about deeply across the novel. This becomes a beautiful opportunity and invitation for readers to think about what freedom means and who gets to be free and the cost of freedom when we don't think about the good of everyone. What does it mean to you to be a Black creator? Hmm. It means to be part of a continuum. I mean, one of the great pleasures that I was looking forward to, to be in the world of the published authors is that I can be part of this vast collection of writers, thinkers, artists, all sorts of ways of being in the written world. Um, So for me, it's, the, you know, there's, I often think there's a certain way that I've come to my Blackness based on how my family raised me that I often um, find is different from other people. And I really, really appreciate that and love it. And I think it invites me to see myself um, as one of many different um, 
ways of living into the, these particular cultural gifts. And so I think of the people who came before me, the Frederick Douglasses, the Angela Davises, um, and the folks who are current in like my love of black writers, like Ross Gay and Jacqueline Woodson. And, and then I know there are people who are coming, you know? So I think for me, it's this delight that these particular cultural um, entries, you know, coming from enslaved communities, coming from freed communities from the continent, coming from all these different places are, are, um, building something new. And it's so exciting to, to think about that and to know that I'm just like one little dot <laughs> in this long line, you know, this is sort of like Milky Way of different ways of being Black and then different ways of engaging in art and different ways of inviting young people in. It's just, it's very cool. Well, thank you so much, Fawebe. It's been an absolute pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for checking out this episode of the Black Creators Series, a Candlewick Press and Red Clay Educators collaboration. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notifications button so you won't miss an episode. For more information about the Black Creators Series, go to blackcreatorsseries.candlewick.com or soniacherrypaul.com or go to redclayed on Twitter and Instagram.